So next up is Rob Cavanaugh, also Irish, and I think you should feel right at home here in the cafe as he used to play bass in a band and uh, used to go to gigs all the time. So Rob is going to talk to us about stars further away from home and specifically their interactions with exoplanets around them and how those interactions can result into radio signals, as far as I understand. But we're going to hear more about that. I think they're dealing with the prices. I think that's fine, Rob. I think you can come up and we can start sort of with your talk. So give them a big applause. see them, but they're there. 
and you know we have telescopes that can see them uh, with much greater detail than, or with a much higher sensitivity level than our uh, eyeball. Um, uh, so as I said, so these kind of solar type stars are very common in our Milky Way, uh, but even between themselves, they're quite different, and then the kind of environment around the planets might live in are also quite different. So a G type star, so the sun effectively, you can think of it as something like this. And so this uh, blue ring here kind of represents this uh, region around uh, the star where it's, uh, you know, the, the temperature of a planet that would be sitting in front of it uh, is just right enough so that if there's water there, it's not going to either evaporate off if it's too close or freeze if it's uh, too far away. So, you know, we have one extreme like uh, Mercury or Venus, and then further to we have, you know, something like Jupiter. So if you put, if you put the Earth out at the distance of where Jupiter is, it's not going to be a very nice place to be. Uh, and so then, going into these uh, smallest stars, you know, called n dwarfs, which I'm kind of going to shift focus towards now, um, the, this region, which I forgot to say, is called the habitable zone. You may have heard of this before, it's, if you've seen any of the press releases of like, discoveries of planets, uh, this region is a lot closer to the star. And so what is also quite interesting about them, of course, is that uh, they're also thought to host multiple Earth-sized planets very close in. So, so okay, what, like 75% of all uh, stars in the Milky Way are like this, and then they probably all they probably all have lots of uh, rocky plants. So like a, not a planet like Jupiter, which is a ball of gas, but you know a rocky object that you could stand on and potentially live on. Um, and so then you might have heard about this uh, cool discovery a few years ago. Uh, there is a system called Trappist, and they found seven uh, Earth-like planets around. They're not all habitable, but these three, I believe, are. <laughs> um, so, okay, so all these plants are probably out there around these avatars, which are super common in the Milky Way. But it's actually quite difficult to find them because they're relatively small. So there are these two methods that are, you know, kind of the go-to uh, techniques for finding exoplanets at the moment. One of which is called this transit method, and so you pretty much just look at the star for a certain amount of time. And then if a planet goes in front of it, just like a, a lunar eclipse, so when the moon goes in front of the sun, or a solar eclipse, <laughs> uh, you see a dip in light. Obviously, here in this example, the, the planet doesn't block out the star completely, but you can still measure this, and this has been a very successful uh, method for finding exoplanets. Uh, and then similarly, you have this other method, which is maybe not so clear, but basically what happens is, the presence of the planet around the star causes it to wobble, and we can measure this wobbling. And so this is another method that can be used to detect planets, especially in the case where they don't actually transit the disk of the star, which is cool. But as you can see, so I've, I grabbed all this data here uh, during the day, and this is like all the exoplanets that they found to date. And so there's just under 5,000. I feel like every time I look at this number, or I check what number it's gone up by like a thousand, which is kind of mad, it's just going to keep happening for the rest of our lives, probably. Uh, so on the y-axis here, I promise there are many graphs. This. <laughs> on the y-axis here, you can see the planet mass, and then, to, and then on the x-axis here, uh, you can see how far away the planet is from the star. And so you can see that there's this real bias towards like, much more massive planets. So I've plotted here Jupiter and Earth as reference point. You can see most of these are Jupiter-sized or bigger, and they're also generally closer to the star than Earth is. So, so like this is how far Earth is from the Sun, and then anything on the left-hand side is closer than the Earth is to the Sun. So you see it's this huge big bulk of planets that are much closer to the star. And obviously this is not a reflection of the actual population of what uh, planets look like, or planetary systems look like. And so it's kind of lonely down here. And so Kermit is kind of <laughs> reflecting that motion. Uh, so that's, that's the main takeaway here, is that there's this bias towards these massive close-in plants. And so another thing to bear in mind is, okay, just 
dreaded think of the end dwarfs. That's the these are our favorite star, okay? Uh, not the sun. <laughs> uh, they they can also be quite active to the point where there are lots of these like flares going on all the time. I heard about solar flares. And dwarfs also uh, exhibit flare flaring activity. Uh, so much so to the point that any kind of signals that are produced like this, particularly with the radial velocity measurement, with the radial velocity method, is the signal is effectively completely destroyed. It's just white noise compared to the kind of uh, light that's given off by these flares. So it, it that's you know partly the reason as to why this area down here is so empty. Um, so. The kind of answers to this question is kind of already been given away, but maybe it's just an extension of the quiz. So, does this shape? I don't know how well you can see this on the um, on the slide, but um, I've asked only non astronomers that answer this because I think it's pretty obvious to <laughs> people. Um, does this remind anyone of anything? Maybe like a household object or a toy that they would have played with. Anyone? No? Yeah. A bar magnet. <laughs> <laughs> so, the main thing is that, okay, solar light stars exhibit magnetic fields generally. Okay? And so, so these, especially for M dwarfs, their magnetic fields are much stronger than the sun. So they, they kind of permeate out into this environment around, this, around the star where planets could live. Uh, to a much greater extent, and their presence is felt by the planets. Uh, and so we heard about the solar wind a bit in Laura's talk, and so just to kind of recap, the solar wind is an expansion of hot magnetized plasma from the surface of the star. We don't know why it's so hot, especially, if, okay, we don't even know why it's so hot for the sun, so why it's so hot for other stars as well, it's just a whole other uh, problem. But, I mean, this is what we think happens. So, okay, for some reason, the atmosphere of the sun gets very hot at a certain distance from it. And so then this just expands. And if there's planets in the way, they're going to uh, be bombarded with this outflow of material. And so, yeah, as we heard earlier, this kind of uh, process can cause the aurora borealis on the Earth. Um, and so then, kind of, this is where I have to try and explain things that are very confusing to me <laughs> in layman terms, so I'll try my best here. So, as I said, uh, M dwarfs, they have a very strong magnetic field, right? Uh, and so if it has a strong magnetic field and then it also has potentially an Earth's side planet orbiting around it, it can interact with the star itself through this magnetic field, which is very dominant in the surrounding environment. And so there's this idea, which we've kind of been playing around with in the literature for the last few years, that is analogous of what's observed between Jupiter and its moon Io. So if you didn't know, Jupiter has a, a moon. Uh, it's actually a volcanic moon. It's the only volcanic body we know in the solar system apart from the Earth, an active volcanic body. Um, and so basically what happens between Jupiter and Io is because it's so close to Jupiter, it can interact with its magnetic field. And I was trying to think of what's a good analogy and the best I could come up with, which I think is pretty decent actually, is that think that the magnetic field of Jupiter is like guitar strings. And this plant going around is kind of plucking the strings and sending waves down back towards Jupiter along these field lines or strings. And so we can detect this at various different wavelengths. This is like a UV image, I believe, of uh, Jupiter's pole, and you can see this bright spot here. And so this is actually this point where this field line or string connects back to the surface of Jupiter. And the idea then is that you know, for a star and a planet, we can have the same uh, scenario, just kind of scaled up, where Jupiter is a star, and Io, which is a moon in this case, is now a planet. And so this, so these kinds of interactions are possible when the planet is inside the star's magnetic field. That's just as much as you need to know really to understand this. 
And for M dwarfs, this is more likely to occur because they have very strong magnetic fields, and so these field lines can reach out like very far distances. Um, so I tried to find, so you may have seen in my title, uh, I was talking about radio emission. So this is what I really do like in my day to day life. Um, and I was trying to find a nice animation to illustrate this process, and I couldn't find one, so I tried to make one, and it came out very funny. So I'm just going to show you how that turned out. So basically, in this process, when when the planet plucks the string, it sends weight, it sends energy down along the field line, okay? And so this energy at some point is converted into exciting electrons. When an electron, this is just like basic physics, I guess. Uh, when electrons uh, are accelerated in magnetic fields, specifically in a circular motion, it produces uh, radiation. So, and then just you can think again, if anyone plays guitar, the, you know, the tension of the string determines what frequency that you hear this, the, the sound that. Similarly here, just the strength of the magnetic field on, along this line determines the frequency at which radio emission is generated. And so, yeah, this was my attempt at trying to explain this. <laughs> so, I'll leave that play. So, I'm not talking about the kind of radio emission that you can detect with you know, this. I'm talking more about this, which is like a dish that's like 100 meters uh, in size. Um, and so then, in terms of what I actually do, so what I do is, uh, we, we heard from more about uh, measuring the solar wind properties with satellites that we set up. All these stars that are interesting are way too far away. We'll never ever go there unless uh, we don't understand physics, um, which we don't. Um, and so what we have to do is we want to model these environments based on observations we can get from the star here on Earth. We want to produce models of this environment around the star. And so this is what I do. I do these simulations, and you get these nice uh, three-dimensional snapshots of the star. And so then we can play all these games. So like, um, there's this uh, well-known M dwarf called A. Mick, and it was recently detected to have not one but two planets very close in. And so this white line here kind of illustrates this region that I was talking about, where it's kind of inside the star's magnetic field. Okay, and so the, in this region. It's, is when these uh, star plant interactions can occur. And so you can see that when it's inside, these uh, lines connect to the planets. It's the planet orbit here. I'm just showing the inner orbit here for clarity, but this is also happening for another planet just slightly further out here. And so inside this region, these, you know, the planet is plucking the strings and waves are traveling back and then radio emission is being generated. And so the idea here is that, you know, we can take planetary system that we know and predict what this radio emission would look like over time if we were to observe it with a telescope such as LOFAR, which is which maybe you've heard of, which is up near Dwingle, I believe that's how you pronounce it. And so that's what that looks like here. And so so that's cool. So I mean we can we can make predictions as to what this kind of stuff should look like and then test our theories. And then, okay, why do we want to do this? Okay, one, we want a method that is not uh, hindered by this kind of stellar activity. So these kind of signals are not, you know, limited to just these massive planets necessarily. So in theory, we could, you know, start to probe these kind of regions down here, where these uh, rocky planets live, which are obviously ones that we're trying to find. The second thing is that we want to find out how much mass is being lost through these stellar winds, because this has obviously consequences for the habitability of orbiting planets. So like if if the stellar wind is very, very strong, it's going to completely erode the atmosphere of the planet. And then this also ties into this sort of fact we can also determine the planet has a magnetic field of its own, which could act as a shield. And if it doesn't have one, we could end up with a scenario like like Mars down here, which is very dusty and it had water at some point, and then it got all dried up because it has a very weak magnetic field, is what people think. 
so finally then, this is the last thing I want to talk about is we can kind of approach this uh, from another angle where we have a, an end dwarf with radio observations, but we don't know if there's a stir there. And so what I've been working on recently is um, there are recently these observations made with this low fur telescope just up in the north of Holland. And they found this radio mission which is kind of consistent with these models that we're predicting of uh, interactions between stars and planets. And so we can kind of place a test planet in the stellar environment that we simulate and then predict what the radio mission would look like. And so then we're changing how far away the planet is, how big it is, so on and so forth, we can produce this signal and compare it to the observations and see how it compares. And so what you can see here is that we can reproduce these observations very well with uh, a Neptune side the planet around the star. And so that's kind of what we're trying to nudge this area towards is, you know, a new method of detecting exoplanets, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's that's all I had to talk about. I'll move at these conclusions here. Um, so, as I said, many undetected planets out there. We probably will never find them all. Uh, a lot of them are likely to uh, undergo these star planet interactions. Uh, radio telescopes are very good at probing these in theory. And then um, there's obviously a lot we can learn about this uh, in terms of detecting and predicting these uh, detectors. So I'll leave you with this little animation again. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, happy to take questions. So yeah, so because the, it's independent of where the planet is in theory, you can have a scenario where, okay, say the planet is orbiting like like this in the plane of the sky, so you will never see that unless it's... There are some other methods that you can detect it, but for the sake of simplicity, let's just say you could never detect it th through those two methods I mentioned. But because the magnetic field is there, yes, it could still pluck those strings and you could still detect it with their condition. Any more questions? Comments, queries? Life advice. <laughs> yeah? 
So there's so the questions how many have been detected. So there's been 19 uh, you know, tentative detections, but like none have been ruled out as being confirmed as of a planet uh, origin or a planet induced origin. So we're trying to nail them down with these models. Uh, but yeah, uh, the main bottleneck is kind of not having enough uh, observations. So these 19 observations that we're taking, they're only like eight hour windows generally. So really what you want is like to observe a star for a very long time, like hundreds of nights uh, with, with the single radio telescope, which is hard to do because people want to do lots of different science with all these telescopes. So firstly, the nice thing about M dwarfs is that because their magnetic fields are so strong, they can reach quite far out to this point where the habitable zone lies. Uh, in terms of uh, magnetic effects, I'm not aware of any kind of feedback from the star directly through these magnetic field lines. I haven't come across anything like that before. But one thing I would say is that you know, end dwarfs, you know, a lot of the time they're very active, so they're probably flaring. And so you can imagine, a, imagine living on a planet or in a star that has thrown off these massive eruptions like ten times a day. You're probably not going to want to stay there for very long. So. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, I'm not aware of. Probably, <laughs> it's probably not a good place for you. But you can theorize. Everyone's <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay, thanks very much.